So I'm just curious, so it's just a simple, simple poll. How many of you went physically, not online, but went physically shopping for Black Friday? I knew our congregation is intelligent. Overwhelmingly, (laughs) most of us didn't go out. Okay, so, but how many were online Friday for Black Friday? No, not as many as I expected. How many are waiting for Cyber Monday tomorrow? How many are not buying gifts for their family this year? <laughs> That's what we're going to talk about, actually, this morning. We're going to talk about gifts, and this is, this is kind of one of those moments as well. You come through Thanksgiving and all the activities and parties and, and all the fun and all the food and everything like that. I want you to know our Thanksgiving was great. All the kids came over to the house. We were all together. They taught me a brand new game. Um, that I had never played before, not video game this time. It was actually a board game. We had to talk to one another and, uh, and, and not online. And, uh, and um, I just, in all humility, need to tell you, I won. <laughs> My first time to ever play it, and I was victorious. It was tight for a few moments. My son's fiance and I were back and forth, and then my wife and I were back and forth, which is always scary when I'm playing games because typically if it looks like she's got a bit of the edge, I just give in and quit. It's just better in the long run to let her win and and for me to go ahead and lose. Um, But I actually won for a change. So it was fun, it was Thanksgiving. We got this message this week, we finished up with parables, and then next week, it's Christmas. I don't, are we decorating this week? I'm not actually sure. We're decorating this week, and so we got all that taking place, and, and um, it's Christmas songs next week. It's a Christmas message next week, and we start into Christmas. And so in my mind, it's kind of all about gifts right now. You know, if, even if you didn't go to Black Friday or didn't spend time online, we're all thinking about it. We're all dreaming about it. I've already heard from some of the kids this morning that know exactly what they want for Christmas, and they're looking forward to it. And it just kind of dawned on me in kind of a realization. There's this little verse. I think about it a lot when I think about the good things that happen in life. It's found in James. It's in verse 17 of chapter 1. So James 1, 17. You can go there. You can look it up. If you're on new version, somebody else was teaching this morning other than me, and that got changed at the last minute. So it's not on new version. The notes are not there today. You're going to have, we have to go old school. So get a piece of paper, grab a connect card, Grab an offering envelope. You can turn your notes in with your gifts after this after the service. We're, we're, it's just this little tiny verse that talks about gifts, and it says, "Every good and perfect gift." Which you have to think about that for a minute. Every good and perfect gift, and it doesn't qualify. Who gives us that gift? It just simply says, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, which means James' interpretation of that in that passage as he's writing it, inspired of the Holy Spirit, so it is the Word of God, as he's writing it, understands any good gift any one of us has ever received or ever recognized was good and perfect, which means perfect in every way possible. It is the distribution of that at the right time and the right thing, whatever it might be, came from our Heavenly Father, came from God. And then the very last part of the verse just summarizes and brings it all together that these gifts that come down from our Heavenly Father in all the lights and beauty of glory, these gifts are from Him and He is everlasting and absolutely consistent. James describes it by saying there are no shadows, no shifting shadows in him. To me, it helps me find strength in the darker moments of life because they come. They're there. They they happen. And it allows me to look at situations that sometimes I don't completely understand and recognize God's intention is benevolence. God's intention is love. He always is working in my life, whether I recognize it or not, he's always working in my life in such a way that he wants to bless me. And that's what James describes. 
Matter of fact, it's interesting in verse 16, so it's James chapter one, verse 16, 17, and 18, but the contextual verses just simply say, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, my family, don't be deceived, for every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And then the other side of that context is, by his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth, which that is Jesus. Jesus is the word of truth. Jesus brings us the word of God. He gives us birth by his decision, that father of lights, that heavenly father, that father who is in heaven gives us these gifts and then gives the ultimate gift in Jesus so that we would be a kind of first fruits, that we would be the first product of God's creation and salvation in the midst of all creation. And we're gonna talk a lot about gifts, not here, not teaching. We're, we're gonna talk a lot about gifts over the next few weeks. And we've probably already been thinking about them and our, our good forward-thinking planners, they've, they've already been looking and, and, and trying to figure things out and, and make sure everybody gets what is right, what is good, and what is perfect. And yet James understands his comprehension of the very process of gift giving is that God has already given us the best gift in Jesus. And so it's an exciting time of year. It's not just that we've had holiday and we've traveled and we visited and some are watching on live stream because you're traveling back or because you had so much fun this week and got together with so many people. You're, you're sick and illness and we're glad you got live stream to be able to join us in that fashion. God gave us Jesus, which is what we will celebrate for the next few weeks. The opportunity to know God in a personal fashion. Because gifts are beautiful. Gifts are spectacular. Gifts are enjoyable. Every once in a while you get the one that wasn't, but that's not coming from God. That's coming from Uncle Somebody. And in the end, God's intention is that we receive them. There's, there's no real qualification here. It's just the nature of the grace of God that every good and perfect gift comes. I like what, the, what David wrote in Psalms 107, verse 21. He says, let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for all humanity for his faithful love and his wondrous works for all of humanity, for all of mankind. God is working, has worked in the past, he's working now, he's going to work in the future for all mankind. We're all the recipients of these beautiful gifts that James is referencing. Every one of us receives them. It's just hard sometimes to notice or recognize them. I think about it related to medical things a lot because I deal with a lot of medical issues as a pastor and help walk people through those moments and I have to walk through those moments myself. A number of years ago, some who have been here a while might remember, I had back issues that made it impossible for me to walk. I was teaching in a stool up here, not because it was trendy, but because I couldn't stand up and had to go through the whole process, have back surgery. And I remember my doctor telling me, we're going to do this back surgery, all kinds of names that I didn't understand. We're going to do this because anything more than this is permanent and we can't change it. And it's just a one-time shot. He said, but if I do this other surgery, it's not a one-time shot. I'm telling you, it's not gonna work indefinitely. You're going to be back here again. You're gonna be having surgery again at some point in time. But if we do this, our intention is to carry over and maybe you have three, four, five years before you have to have surgery again and, and we can keep doing this repeatedly throughout your life. Don't you love it when the doc you go to the doctor's office and he tells you, hey, we can take care of this but we're gonna become really good friends over the next three decades. I mean, it's always so encouraging. At least he was a friendly doctor and I could look forward to spending time with him in my future. And so he did that because he was hoping. The intent of the surgery was that there would be some discovery, some breakthrough, some technological thing that would take place and they would understand how to address the issue and how to address it more effectively and maybe even potentially permanent in a way that doesn't mess you up for anything else down the line. And it's been, I should have looked it up this morning, it's been seven years 
So my three years turned into seven, and I have no intention to see him any time in the near future. He's a great doctor. Half our church has had surgery from him. He's, he's a great guy, and love him and appreciate him, and I'm thankful for him. But in that process of sorting all that out of my head, that we're going to do a surgery that's not going to completely finish something, it's only going to give us this kind of time out to hold on in hopes that something else would happen further down the road that would make it easier to address the issue in a more effective manner. And that's one of the times I first started looking at this verse and started thinking. I appreciate the doctor. I am grateful for his studies. I'm grateful for his experience. I am grateful for all the technology that surrounds that part of the medical industry, really all the medical industry. But I recognize, and and these verses begin to resonate in my head. Every good and perfect gift, the gift of a medical procedure, the gift of medical knowledge, the gift of medical technology, the gift of being able to find at least temporary healing in that moment caused me to recognize what James is saying is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. It was God's gift. It was God's gift of healing. It was God's gift of ministering. And he's working through the doctor and he's working through his staff and he's working through all the engineers and innovators in the medical industry. But it was God's gift. And that's what David is recognizing when he says the Lord's faithful love and his wondrous works for all humanity, for all mankind. We're receiving gifts every day. And I think, at least for me, sometimes I fail to recognize the ultimate source of those gifts. And we've just come out of Thanksgiving, where we have, since Abraham Lincoln declared it, we have celebrated the necessity and the importance and the the privilege of gratitude. But I want to shift and transition from Thanksgiving into Christmas, recognizing that the greatest gifts of my life have come from God. There may have been other conduits, other venues, other mechanisms that were in place, but ultimately it was from him. And it's been out of his love and out of the wondrous nature of his grace and his works, his activity for us. It's easy sometimes to think he's not working. When what James is wanting to remind us is he is working. And it's obvious in the beauty of what he accomplishes. In Psalms 103, it says, but from eternity to eternity, the Lord's faithful love is toward those who fear him and his righteousness toward the grandchildren. These gifts are coming, but they're coming multi-generations and they're coming faithfully since creation. I mean, in and of itself, creation is an amazing, perfect, and good gift from him. And we see it and we experience it and we recognize it, but do we really stop to embrace the gratitude of that moment and recognize, thank you for all of this for every leaf, for every, every drop of rain, for, for every moment of sunshine, for everything in creation, it's come from him and it's his faithful love again and it's for every generation. It's applicable to me, it's applicable to my children, it'll be applicable to my grandchildren. It's, it's, a, it's a process in which God's good and perfect gifts come to us from him. And at Christmas time, we'll stop and we'll recognize Jesus is the ultimate expression of that gift. Jesus, and you you know, most of you, whether you've ever even been to church before, ever even have an idea of what it means to be a Christian or to know Christ, you have a basic grasp, a basic picture of the story that we're going to tell over and over again for the next few weeks. That a virgin was confronted by angels who announced to her she would give birth to a child. No simple child. No no everyday turn of events for a family somewhere in the midst of of, um, Bethlehem, in the midst of those moments, in the midst of Galilee. No, this child would be the savior 
of the world, the one who would rescue. It would be the ultimate expression of God's gift giving because now what we've seen by faith, we will have a very short period of time that we will see in person. And in the process of the Son of God coming to earth, he would live with us, he would demonstrate how he's here to help us, to comfort us, to guide us, to move us closer to himself, more, closer to the giver. And in doing so, would even die on the cross. And even more importantly, be resurrected and raised from the grave, conquering death, conquering sin, so that you and I might have life and might have the light of the heavenly Father who gives these gifts from above in us and living through us and experiencing it. So it's not just the gift, it's the giver. And it's the beauty of that moment and it's God's faithfulness. And it doesn't become a trend in one moment and not in the next. Because God does it for one generation and then turns around and does it again for the next generation. And that's what James is recognizing. He gives, the psalmist is recognizing, he gives this righteousness, this love, this gift, even towards the next generation, toward the grandchildren, toward the youngest, to the littlest baby in the room. God's love is continuing to be given over and over and over again. And we're the recipients of that. He's doing it simply because he cares about us and because he loves us. By his nature, he's a giver. And he's a consistent giver. That last part of verse 17, who does not change like shifting shadows. It's easy to quote, look, and look at Psalms and, and let those become expressions from our own heart. Like Psalms 136 that says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. But James recognized that. That many of our experiences in life are changing and variable and ultimately unreliable and undependable. You could get all excited about a gift. You could get all excited about the one who's given it to you. But do you have confidence that it is a lasting gift? I mean, I'm talking to the parents for the most part now, but how many times as a parent have you gone and purchased a gift for your kids that they just have to have or it's not gonna be the Christmas that they think it's supposed to be? And you know, as you're checking out, this gift has a lifespan. And if it's a toy with electronics and parts and you're giving it to a son, the lifespan is exponentially short. I mean, you know. How many times do we give a gift we know isn't going to be used, isn't going to be workable, and it's going to fall apart, will be damaged, will we'll wear out, whatever the circumstances are. And we know that in advance. We're, we're surrounded by the temporal nature of our humanity. We know it. And so it's a natural reaction when we talk about gifts and giving and we talk about receiving those gifts or even being the giver in this case and knowing that those gifts have a limited shelf life. I mean, some things last And then you get to be my age and you realize, okay, this last, we still have it. And our kids are going to get it. And what was initially a gift and a moment of grace is now a liability because they don't know what to do about it. But we kept it all those years and so now they feel guilty. You can't just run it over to the resale shop. What are they going to do with it? Maybe they hold on to it and it's just gonna go to, the, and so down the line, those things that are so-called built to last, they just continue, but with no purpose and, and, and for the most part, no real drive on the part of the recipients because it loses its meaning and significance over time. We live in a temporal world. We understand that. We see it. We experience it. We're, we're a part of it and we recognize it. And so we are by nature environmentally challenged 
to think in terms of eternity or to think in terms of any kind of permanence because we just simply don't expect it to last. And our attention spans are short. How many of us have ever received a gift that was extremely well built or extremely well made? And after a few years, you're looking at it and you're knowing that somebody gave it to you, but you're really wanting a newer style. Even if the material lasts, our attention span doesn't last. And James understands this. And there's no reason to want anything new. There's no, there's no reason to be doubtful or cynical or skeptical about what you're receiving when it comes up from a good and perfect gift that our heavenly Father, who is the Father of all lights and the, the Father of all things that are blessings to us, gives it to us because he doesn't change like shifting shadows. He's eternal. Psalms 107 says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Sometimes I doubt the permanency of God because of my inability to live through faithfully or to endure or to persevere. But my inability to last doesn't in any way reflect on God's ability to bless in every moment. We were talking in the office this morning and we coined the phrase, Pastor Cody thinks I need to start a new blog in the phrase. And what we, what we were talking about is how I really don't want to be resuscitated because I'm looking forward to resurrection. And we're talking about Lazarus. Lazarus is found in John chapter 11. And Lazarus is a man who passes away. Jesus isn't there at the time. The scene's very dramatic. His sisters are upset. They're crying. They're even kind of angry because Jesus couldn't be there in time. He passes away. Jesus shows up. He challenges them to recognize that Jesus himself is the resurrection and life. He's the one that holds life in his hands. This gift of a baby will celebrate, becomes a man who not only can teach, but will do miracles that are amazing and astounding. And Jesus brings Lazarus back from the dead. And we were speculating. There's a bunch of pastors sitting around. We talk about weird things sometimes. It's just who we are. And we talk, we're speculating, well, where was Lazarus in the interim period? Well, while he was dead and waiting for Jesus to show up, to comfort his sisters and to bring him back to life. Did he get to see heaven in that moment? Was it like a, a waiting room or was he just like unaware? We don't have that information. But everything in scripture indicates the moment you die, you're immediately in the presence of God. And so I was picturing Lazarus as, they, as Jesus tells him, hey, move the stone back, open it up. And Jesus calls out, Lazarus, come out. And I was picturing the crowd's amazed, they're happy, they're joyous. I'm imagining, I'm imagining Lazarus looking around going, I'm still here? I mean, he, the joy of our faith is we have something to look forward to when this is over with. I'm gonna be honest with you, I'd be disappointed. Not that I don't love my family, not that I don't love you, but you all are gonna eventually get to where I'm going one way or the other. Thinking, Wow. And then, in Lazarus's case, in case you're not familiar with the story, within a week of Lazarus's new life after he's been, after he's been resuscitated and brought back to life, the, the, the legal authorities and the religious authorities are plotting to kill him because they don't like his testimony because his testimony is validating who Jesus is. And so we're told that immediately they're plotting. Hey, Lazarus, welcome back. Sorry you, know, sorry you died, glad you're back. We're gonna have a party next week. We're all getting together, but don't drink the punch because <laughs> they're trying to kill you. You know, make sure the dog eats your, part of your dinner before you do. I don't wanna be resuscitated and be back. I wanna be resurrected. I wanna be there because there is eternity with this God who is the God whose faithful love endures forever. It's never going to break. It's never going to wear out. It's never going to get old because it's the nature of his love for us. It doesn't change like shifting shadows. Everything in our life changes. The trends changes. The clothing changes. The jobs change. The, 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 what's popular changes. Everything in our lives are temporal by nature. 
except if you've made the decision to trust in Jesus and believe in Jesus and make him the Lord, the one who's in charge of your life, giving him control, that doesn't change. He's always faithful, he's always loving, and he's always there. Timothy is a protege of Paul, and Paul writes Timothy, and in his letter, he, in a sense, blesses God. He says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. A God who gives us gifts regularly, and those gifts are good and perfect, A God who gives us gifts out of his heart, even in eternity. A God who gives us gifts out of the eternal nature of who he is and so that it doesn't shift and change on us and change or wear out or get old. That God is worth thanking because he's doing it every single day for each and every one of us. So I just want to encourage you as we transition from Thanksgiving and start to move towards Christmas, be thankful for the greatest gift, Jesus. And knowing Jesus is a life-changing experience. And if you don't know him, then meet him and enjoy this Christmas with a new perspective as a Christian, as a believer. Meet Jesus, know Jesus, trust Jesus, let Jesus be in control, let him live in and through us and receive a gift that will never change, even though receiving the gift changes everything else. So I don't know what it is you're gonna face this week. Maybe it's troubles at work. Maybe it's hard things at school. Maybe it's something somebody said. Maybe it's something that's going on in your life. It may be issues related to any number of things, health, economy, anything at all. We all have the potential to face difficult things this week. And I just simply want to remind you that the nature of God's love for us is such that this week, in the midst of the hard things, God is giving a gift. And it's a perfect gift. And it's from his heart coming down from heaven because of his love. And he will not change and will not let us down in any way.